Entonces empezamos ya con la primera de las mesas que van a tener lugar esta mañana aquí. Nuevo escenario, un espacio común en la economía del valor compartido. Los componentes de la mesa son Michael Clifford, vicepresidente de Unified, del Unified Circuit Group en Europa, Oriente Medio y África, Gary Kilder, Chief Human Resource Office de IBM Corporation Europa, y el moderador, que es Matty Hemi, CEO y fundador de Innovation, no sé si lo he pronunciado bien, que será el responsable y quien vaya liderando este debate. Es un debate que va a tener lugar en inglés, pero bueno, entendemos que si no todo el mundo en inglés, algunos de los mensajes principales los tendremos en la pantalla en castellano para que todos podamos seguir más o menos el debate. Y antes de todo este debate, les vamos a pedir que presten atención porque vamos a poner un vídeo sobre la economía del valor compartido, Economy Share Value. Vemos este vídeo. Problems of the environment, society, local economies, corporations have been blamed for viewing these concerns as threats to profit. But what if these problems weren't threats? What if they were opportunities? Not only to make the world a better place, but to increase profit. What if ignoring these opportunities put the future of your business at risk, while embracing them meant outperforming your peers? This isn't some dream, it's reality. But it requires a change of mindset, a shift away from a narrow focus on earning profits toward a broader, long-term focus on what we call creating shared value. Creating shared value operates on three levels. Reconceiving products and markets in ways that meet customer needs while also contributing to society. Redefining productivity in your value chain through social or environmental innovation. And cluster development. Supporting the well-being of industries related to your own in ways that improve societal conditions. These aren't just theories. Each of these approaches have been successfully demonstrated by major corporations. General Electric has developed new health imagination products to deliver high-quality, low-cost care to mothers in developing countries. Intercontinental Hotels Group has implemented Green Engage, an innovative, cost-saving online tool to help its hotels control energy consumption. And Nestle has given resource-strapped farmers in developing economies financial and technical assistance to create a better supplier network. Creating shared value is not an option. It's the future. Las compañías deben revisar la forma de hacer negocios para dar respuesta a sus stakeholders y ser socialmente responsables. ¿Qué tendencias diferenciales de gestión marcan las organizaciones pioneras en RSC? ¿Cómo tiene que ser la cultura y la forma de trabajar para comprometer a los clientes internos y externos? Nuevo marco europeo. A todas estas preguntas darán respuesta a esta mesa moderada por Mati Hevi. Dejamos aquí. Good morning, everyone. And please give an applause to my invitees, Mary Kilder from IBM and Michael Clifford from Unify. Please an applause to warm up the environment. Thank you very much. This is also a way to make sure that you are understanding English, so I saw you can follow. And so that my colleagues as well can understand to follow up more than two words uh -huh. every three minutes, you said? Every three minutes, yes. Every three minutes, okay. So it's my pleasure to be here with you today when I was invited by Stephanie to be here moderating this, this conversation, actually. Um, I really liked it because when we met about three, four months ago, we were discussing about a concept that in our company we call the plus, plus, plus paradigm, which I was briefly telling you about before. And the plus, 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 which sounds really a little bit naive, means... I'm okay, you're okay, and everyone else is okay. Which in actual terms means <clears throat> I accept myself, I accept you, and I accept others. This very simple definition is actually something that is changing the world. We can, we can see it so, through social networks, we can see it through corporate or, or socially responsible corporations. And this is something that we've been missing as human beings. Uh, it's quite interesting when we're saying that we want to humanize companies, and actually I, would, I was thinking about acknowledging what we in Spanish say, like re-knowing, uh, understanding again what the company is about, because it's been a way to organize ourselves to produce better results. And somehow, over the last 300 years, we have uh, tried to improve technology, to improve quality, to improve how we do things, to get maximum productivity. And in that path, we forgot about 
us as, as human beings. Something we have seen in, in uh, organizations when we do our work through our consultancy and what we did, I did before as, as a managing director was that we as human beings are not very well understood. I'm an engineer by profession, mechanical engineer actually, and sometimes people ask me, what are you doing? Talking, about like, talking like a psychologist. And I said that I needed to understand the systems that we were handling, and I needed to understand the, the levers that I could pull to actually get the best results. And the system is actually us. We have a brain. I call it, we all have a boss, a brain operating system. And if we don't understand how we perform as human beings, how our emotions, our attitudes, our thoughts are, bless you, are um, um, creating intention and behaviors, we don't understand how we produce results. In our philosophy, what we call the plus, 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 all starts with one plus, which is you. You as a person, you as a human being, how's your self-esteem? How good are you in believing in yourself? How much you believe in what you can achieve? How much you can believe in your can <laughs> capabilities? If you believe in yourself, then you can believe in a goal. If you believe in yourself, then you can believe in other people achieving goals. So once you have a high self-esteem, then you can start to believe in other people. And then comes the second plus. So it's other people is actually accepting them as human beings, regardless of their behaviors, thoughts, and feelings. And this is something that we often mix. I can see it. I'm from Finland originally, but I have been brought up in Spain. And I can see it in the, in the Mediterranean culture. I think it's probably everywhere, at least in Europe that we tend to mix behavior with being. So the, the, somebody does something we don't like, and we actually qualify that person as being a jerk or, or qualifying them in, in some way um, without understanding that that person remains perfect as a human being is his behavior, thinking, or feeling that we don't like. And then we say that we, I'm okay and you are not. And then the other person feels I'm not okay and you are. And then we are not in plus plus, we are in plus minus or minus plus. And if we fight because we have the same power, we get in minus minus, and then nothing works. And then companies are having difficulties because we are working in environments with so much pressure, so much stress, that we have more, much more fear than, as the minister said, trust, which is actually what we need. If we have trust, then we trust in ourselves, we trust in our goals, and then we can grow. And that means, I'm going to say, because it's, it's a little bit naive, probably, but lo trust is actually unconditional love. I'm an engineer, remember the mechanical engineer, I'm not a psychologist, I'm talking about love, but in a way which I expect to be understood that you love yourself, you accept yourself, you respect yourself, and that allows you to respect the other person. And when you do that, you, allow, you also respect the third person, which is your customer. So it's us, I respect myself, I respect you, I respect all of you, I respect my customers, and that's, what, that's why I can actually read their needs, their emotions, their thoughts, and I can work out solutions that work for all of us. So with this perspective, this understanding that we are going as a society to this plus, plus, plus paradigm, or the shared value economy, and value being something that has to be, can you hear well? Value being something that it has to be perceived by the one receiving it, not so much by the one delivering it. So we deliver value because they perceive it, and then we get the income. What's your understanding? Michael and, and Gary, about what's going on in the world, and as you're traveling throughout the world, not just Europe, what's going on? What's happening in the world? What's, what are you seeing? Not just in your companies yet. I'm going to be talking first about the world in terms of trends. What are you seeing? Who wants to start? Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, it's nice to be here. It's a great honor to be here to uh, address the Congress. Thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, what I see is I travel around the world. Um, and just so you know, I'm Scottish. Uh, I live in Madrid at the moment. Um, everyone tells me to speak slowly uh, so that if there's any English people in the audience, they can understand what I'm saying. Um, so I'll speak slowly for their benefit. Um, I, I, I think businesses are made up of human beings. So while there are products everywhere, while there are uh, interactions with machines and with technology, um, mankind is human. We are social animals. Um, where I see success, it's about shared value and joint success. And invariably, it's about trust. 
Um, and I think there is much to learn from different cultures around tolerance, around respect. Um, and in the travels I've had around uh, Asia and Africa as a leader in a business, I think there are tremendous benefits to be gained from the humility of the leadership styles that many of those countries and cultures practice. Um, so right now, my opinion would be that uh, I think a lot of what you're talking about is recognized uh, in the working world. I think businesses are doing it, thinking about it, looking at more creative ways uh, to do things. I think cultures expect it. And I think many of the societies and the young people around are looking at what companies do and they expect them to be practicing and having strong values around all of these, these aspects um, that we're talking about. Thank you very much. Michael? Good morning, everybody. Um, th thank you for the question. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I'm English, although I was born in Glasgow. So actually, I'm <laughs> Scottish. Um, but um, Everyone should be. <laughs> everybody, everybody is. Um, so, um, hola. Buenos dias. Está fantástico para aquí. So, just to add to that, um, I think one of the things that also people are starting to understand they need to share in this value chain it is their knowledge. Um, because, particularly with young people, uh, we're with them understanding and having such, such, having such brilliant ideas to bring into the, the, the world and the economy. Um, we've got to capture that in a, in a way where they can contribute and feel part of this value chain. Um, so that, that, that's kind of hard to do because, because, of course, the people that are in businesses today, as I look around the territory that I work <coughs> in, you know, they, they tend to be at least 40 or 50 years old plus, um, tend to be white middle class male, typically, and it doesn't re represent the demographic that, that, um, that that's coming into the world. So this, this trust thing is essential. And I think this, this, um, this idea that the three pluses is, is, a, is, a, is a very interesting way of, of, of getting people to uh, understand how important it is to have some sort of methodology as you approach people and your relationships. Um, at the end of the day, uh, the biggest assets a business has um, are, its, are its people, whether those people are its employees or whether those people are, are indeed its customers who buy its products. And, um, and we haven't quite got to a point yet where, where the value in all those individuals is recognized. Thank you very much. Um, basically, we're going to be talking about three things. One is trends around the world, what are we seeing and, and how are we perceiving it. Uh, we're talking about there's a tsunami coming, technology, technological tsunami, in terms of what's going to be happening. And I was addressing uh, an audience a couple of weeks ago in Ibiza. And this sector, this industry, had been, built, had been growing during the recession with two digits. So I was thinking, what do I tell them? Because these people are so probably um, <coughs> confident that nothing's going to break them. But I actually started to look at the internet, um, what's happening with some industries. And I found a list of 40 or 50 industries which haven't been disrupted yet, which was quite interesting because it was like a target for entrepreneurs. It's like I was, I was telling one of my colleagues yesterday, and it was like going in a submarine and looking through the periscope and thinking, my torpedo, where do I put it? Because there are certain industries which, which have not been disrupted. But certainly there are your industries. Um, I've been investigating a bit, and a little bit of, of what I'm going to be saying, or you're going to be saying actually is, is quite known. Like in your case, IBM has reinvented itself many, many times, and actually is moved from hardware, in sense, not hardware as, as technological hardware, but physical things into more intangible things, and that's quite a transformation that the world is doing. It's actually, we're talking about emotions mostly now, than more than physical things. So, can you share a little bit about how your company has evolved sure. in that I, sense? I mean, for those of you who, who know IBM a little bit, it's a 104-year-old company. And if we think about the technology <coughs> world today and just the pace at which it moves, I don't think you get to survive for 104 years unless you're constantly doing things to change and to reinvent. IBM 
started off making clocks and tabulating machines and actually cheese graters, surprisingly enough. Um, but if you look forward, it's gone through all of the technological trends um, through the mini computer, the personal computer, the supercomputer, into services, into software, and now into areas like the cloud, analytics, mobile, and indeed helping clients and helping cities to become smarter. Um, so I think there is a, a deep down ethic. We know, and many of our leaders and founders know, that we are at our best when we are serving the public interest. So you have to give clients and the public what they want. You have to look at the value you give and you have to make sure you're serving them and staying close to them and listening to what mm -hmm. it is they want. But you have to constantly move because you simply don't survive. Businesses don't survive. Maybe governments and countries don't survive unless they keep moving. But I think one of the things that's fundamental in there is staying true to values and secondly, listening to both your clients and the world around you and to the people who are working for you. Um, so that would be my very short sort of summary okay. in terms of what's happening. But the tsunami has hit. Every business that I'm aware of is facing disruption. It's not about continuous change or moving from something that you recognize on a continuum. It's about being prepared to think the unthinkable, your business model, the way you do things, and to really uh, push yourself to do some different things. So the disruption is there, mm -hmm. for sure. Thank you very much for sharing. Actually, I didn't know about the cheese graters. So very no, nice to, uh, we, to share about know, It's a long, <laughs> long time ago, I think, the cheese yeah. graters. A long time ago. You reminded me of, of a couple of books. One is Built to Last. Um, Paul Russ and Collins talking about companies that survive more than 50, 100 years, growing more than the competition, do so because they have a strong mission, clear mission and clear, clear values. And I was also thinking about what you were mentioning before about learning from, from our kids. Yesterday I was with an... Um, a colleague talking about managers, directors, now the executives are craving how to focus, how to approach the future as it's coming, as, as the tsunami is coming. But at the same time, they are uh, wondering how do I talk to my children because it's difficult to, to do that, and I need to do something new. And taking on your website and, and uh, unify, it's, it's very clear about sharing. It's clear about one world, one thing. But still, you are a young company with a with an old, a long past. Mm -hmm. So, how do you see the evolution also of your company? How has it evolved? How values have shared, been shared, and changed or not? And so, um, it's interesting. So, so Unify has a has a long heritage. It was Siemens once upon. It was part of Siemens um, uh, 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 until about four or five years ago. So, we've had a big change as we've entered into a world um, that, that, that that's moved around us quicker than we've perhaps moved with it. And <coughs> it's fair to say that businesses that have, have organised themselves for the 20th century probably won't survive long in the 21st century. Um, and one of the things that, that, that we believe is, is we call it humanising the workplace, which is kind of similar to, 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 the, to the, uh, the tagline we have here. But in humanising that workplace, we think that um, businesses will become less um, stovepipe less autocratic and we think that we're going to see a world where the individual is a 360 degree person inside an organization so they're a holistic player in the company and that means they've got to then collaborate in a different way and share knowledge in a different way so once upon a time Siemens made or Siemens bought a company that made very good telephones we've now evolved that now we believe that the future is going to be a software-based world to allow people to, um, to move on. Um, and we, we, we confidently believe that those people will be 360-degree individuals in the business. We think also that perhaps um, large hierarchical management um, trees will become uh, less and less, possibly even reduced to perhaps one level. 
um, as people contribute in every aspect of the business rather than just a single role. So we've moved our business from a traditional unified communication company that sold hardware in the, in the form of phones. We now sell uh, a, a service, a communication service that's designed in a social way, kind of like Facebook, so that people can collaborate um, through one single pane of glass, through any single device, because we think that's the way people want to work in the future. Um, we think people want to be mobile. We think people want to be anywhere workers. Um, we think people will want to work at different times of the day. So all of the, the, the preconditions that existed perhaps in the late 20th century, the way business was uh, structured, we think many of, them, many of those rules will be thrown away, giving a far more fluid workforce that, that's an individual that has a 360 degree holistic view on the business. Uh, and and we'll have, clearly we'll have a very strong opinion on the ethics of a value chain trust, as you were saying earlier. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, you reminded me of something. Uh, in year 2000, I used to say that there is a world of self-employment, self-employed uh, professionals coming. Nowadays, we call them entrepreneurs, and it sounds better. And um, we're talking about so entrepreneurship in organizations. Sure. Yeah. And this is something that it's really, mm. we need to recover that spirit, that, mm. that idea of we can produce, we can create new things. And it's, just, it's not just something about following procedures from probably all the people that knew how to do things, which are not anymore the, the needs of the world. We know that in innovation, one of the key, or the key indicator is how much revenue comes from less than five-year-old products, which is one way to measure it, and actually tells you that you are actually listening to your customer needs. But we know that in order to do that, you have to have a culture of innovation, and you have to take care of your internal customers, and therefore the culture is, is the internal market. So in your companies, how are you uh, producing best practices that address this knowing and that being coherent is difficult because your neocortex wants to do one thing, but your limbic system is, is wired through emotions and sometimes fear from the past is tangling with the trust of the future and not everyone is uh, grabbing it at the beginning. So can you share some best practices I, I, on that? I, Matty terrifies me with his questions, by the way, uh, because <laughs> He has studied psychology for 18 years, and I think I've been studied by psychologists for 18 <laughs> years, so it's a different thing. Um, but but, but a, really good, a really good question. Um, I, I had the fortune to be traveling last week, and I actually met a French entrepreneur who was so passionate <coughs> about innovation and creativity that he set up his own business in France. And um, he wanted to get at the brand new people with the brand new ideas um, and invest very, very early in their ideas and their, and their interests. And I was asking him about, so how do you pick these people? And he talked about innovation a lot and he said, and by the way, it applies also equally to, to big businesses because we need, whether you want to call them entrepreneurs or intrapreneurs, we all need the people with ideas. We need the innovation. But I loved what he said. He reeled off a whole set of characteristics that every business would expect. You know, we want them to be resilient and we want them to be agile, that they're fast and they're quick and that they are not worried about the rules and procedures because they're there to hold people in. But I said to him, how do you know if people don't have a track record? So there aren't the measurements or the metrics to tell someone that this is going to be a successful idea. And he said, sometimes it comes down to the individual. It's just an idea and what this individual is like. And I said, so how do you choose? And he answered me very, very simply. He said, it's the fire in their eyes. If they have a fire in their eyes, a passion about what they want to do, they're constantly talking about it, thinking about it, reflecting on how they can have an impact on the world through their business. These are the people I pick. These are the people I pick. It's not, not about the ones with the perfect business plans or the 
perfect you know, timelines or project plans. Mm -hmm. It's much more about the individual and this, this fire. And um, you know, I, I think the fire is very important. I meet lots of young people who have plenty of fire. I meet lots of older people who have the fire too. What I worry most about are the ones when you talk to them who no longer have the fire. And how do we help get it? How do we bring it back for them? What can we do that supports them um, as they think about how to, how to get it back? Thank you very much. I love your answer because it reminds me of um, Nelson Mandela's thought that it's our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. And it's, I was going to think, uh, uh, sorry, I want to ask uh, Michael, how do you pick the fire in Unify? How do you, what the best practices do you do to, to choose those people with the fire? How do you see it? Uh, well, uh, we, we're trying to create a new culture where, where we encourage people to try and to fail. You know, there's nothing wrong with failing. If you're not failing, you're not trying. And of course, it's just getting people over that fear uh, it, it, about their career, about their pension, about you know, how they're going to pay their mortgage if they get fired. You know? mm -hmm. So we, we, we're desperately trying to create a culture where we're encouraging people to try and do something and not to be frightened. And, and if you fail, it's a good thing, providing it's not a crazy you know, thing you're trying to do. Um, so we, we do our very best to support universities. We have, we have intern programs to, to bring people into the business. So they understand who we are, they start to um, see what we're about, and we have the ability then to see you know, w where the fire is. Um, but to Gary's point, the, the biggest challenge in our transformation, and I think every business is transforming from a 20th century to a 21st century company, is there's a, there's a massive amount of you know, middle management um, who, who, are, who are just... Um, we're just going through the motions. And actually, the hardest part of the transformation is to put that fire back in their mm -hmm. eyes. It's actually, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, we are in a very, we're in a great place. There's a lot of very uh, talented young people leaving universities or, or, or simply in employment now that have got the passion and the fire and, and they, they have the energy. They have all of those characteristics. Um, I think our, our biggest challenge uh, in Unify, and I think it's pretty similar in every large corporation, is getting the people that are my age, oh, yeah, right. uh, and making sure you can put the fire back in their eyes to encourage them to try and fail and to be entrepreneurial after many, many years of being very um, stovepiped and controlled. Yeah, thank you very much. And we're getting very close to the end now. Um, before okay. drawing conclusions, there's going to be... What questions? Please? We will ask later if they give us time. Okay. But I want to ask you personally, because it's, sure. to me, all of this is, is good for nothing unless you, every one of us personally, does something new. And it's very easy to talk about extending your comfort zone, leaving it, facing your fears, um, developing your trust and everything, because speaking is free. It, it's for free. You don't, you don't pay for it. But it's your facts, your behaviors, your acts that really give you credibility and coherence. And you both, we, we, we all have children, and we know that they are our best, uh, I wouldn't say customers, but the people that we take most care of and the ones that also can see our coherence or not and will tell us straight without any fear. They will tell us right away. They're not going to be fired. They don't have a mortgage to pay. So how are you, Gary, um, evolving in this process? Because I'm, I'm, what you're telling is, is telling me that you're actually doing it. So how are you facing this transformation personally to have a more shared value economy? Um, I mean, look, on a personal level, um, I, I am an optimist uh, about the world and about people. I'm eternally optimistic. Um, so I like, I enjoy change, and I like challenges. Um, I, like many of the, the audience and many uh, people are working in business, I enjoy most when I have the chance to be with the clients. I enjoy most when I'm with some of our new people and teams who are working together on problems. I enjoy when I have the chance to be out of the business. So from a leadership perspective it, it's, and personal perspective, it, it's really about listening. As I've got a little bit older, um, it's not just the children that you have to think about. I have to listen to my, my Scottish mother as well. And uh, 
she gives me some very good advice. And she says, you know, don't forget, you have two ears and one mouth. So remember, you need to listen more than you speak. And so I think, you know, a, a very underrated quality for leaders, there's two underrated qualities. The first is the listening quality, and that's about deep listening, to figure out what's troubling people, what's troubling clients, what could you do that would help them. So I think deep listening is one. And I think the other is the humility to recognize that you may be a leader or you may be in a position that is a little bit more senior than the others. That does not give you the monopoly on intellect and it does not give you the monopoly uh, in terms of the, the answer. So the power of the network, the power of the team is far superior these days to the power of the individual or the leader. And I think the listening and the humility to be able to look at those things and deal with those things is what it's about. And I try hard to practice that. And I listen a lot to my mother every time I see her. Thank you very much. I love that. And it's also that we, I would add, we have two eyes to also listen oh, through our eyes. I well. agree. I agree with you. Thank I you agree very with much. you. I think it's, it's a very good reminder of, of our physiology. Why is it that, like that? Michael, how, how do you transform yourself? How do you grow to, to this share value economy? Um, I, I am, I'm, I'm reading about it much more than I ever did before. If anybody asked me to read a book on any, on any topic similar to this um, 10 years ago, I, I just wouldn't have found the time. Mm -hmm. um, now I find myself reading about it. Um, personally, on a personal level, you know, I'm, I'm adopting um, a far different approach to how uh, I run the business that I, I, I'm involved in. Um, previously, in, in other, other parts of my career, I've had um, big teams, very hierarchical, very formal, um, and I'm, I'm now convinced that that's history. Um, I listen very carefully to my kids. I watch what they do with technology um, because I, I see the way that decisions are taking place now um, in, in any buying process that are so far removed from the company that's doing the selling that there's a gap there that we've got to try and, 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 and pull together if we're to have as businesses who are owned by shareholders, any influence on, on what we are going to um, have on, 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 on customers uh, past and present. So in summary, you know, I'm looking at my kids a lot, I'm looking at how they're behaving, I'm looking at how they're adopting technology, um, and I'm doing a, you know, something I never would have done 10 years ago. I'm reading about this now, about this change in the world, because I guess 10 years ago I thought I had all the answers. Um, and now I realize I, I truly don't. So that's what I'm doing. Thank you very much. So just to conclude this first uh, conversation we've been having, the three of us, with all of you, in this case, because of time, not listening too much, as Gary is, 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 was suggesting now. And I think this is really the answer, is, is listen more and understand what's going on outside, because inside we already know it. And the more you, uh, you listen, the more chances you have to learn something. And we have to be apprentices all of our lives, I think. Yes, as you were very well saying, in the past, many of us thought, I know it all. And then suddenly, the market tells you, no, you don't, because results are not happening. And then you realize you have to start to, to listen to the market. I, I, what I can get from your answers is that um, you, you too have uh, opened your eyes, your ears, are getting all the information that we need for the market. Oh, we have two more minutes. Uh, I know, two minutes to finish. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Thank you very much. I love these notes because I'm so irreverent. They always share them with the, with the audience. <laughs> We're just finishing. Don't worry, one minute. Um, two questions, I, no? I don't know. You tell, you tell Steffi. Can we have two questions? Yeah. <laughs> so just yes, before the two questions. I hope that you have mirrored through your mirror neurons what these two gentlemen have been sharing because this is really the way to go forward to move into the share value economy <clears throat> and is to be a hum um, humble and to um, take your ego, put it aside and then start to trust more in yourself. Para resumirlo en castellano muy rápido como teníamos previsto espero que de ellos dos habéis, hayáis aprendido la humildad y el, la capacidad para escuchar y para aprender 
tenemos un problema serio en las organizaciones y en nuestras vidas, que no tenemos suficiente confianza en nosotros y lo que tenemos en cambio es miedo, miedo a perder el trabajo, miedo a no poder pagar la hipoteca, miedo a decir lo que somos, lo que queremos. Tenemos una disonancia entre lo que somos con los amigos en el bar y lo que somos en la empresa. Espero que de estos dos caballeros hayáis aprendido pues, a través de las normas espejo que tenemos todos cómo se puede hacer y cómo se puede, a pesar de estar en un puesto directivo muy alto, ser capaz de escuchar y de aprender de los demás. Muchas gracias por vuestra escucha y tenemos dos preguntas. Estefi, me parece todavía, ¿no? ¿Nos das tiempo, no? Nos preguntas si alguien quiere preguntar algo, sino que calle para siempre. El miedo es muy poderoso hoy en día, pero no os va a pasar nada por preguntar. Eh, en inglés, yo creo, si te atreves. En inglés, para mí. <risa> ¿Tenemos micro o cogemos este micro de aquí? O... <risa> Que, no quería que compartiesen alguno de los ponentes. Uh, oh, I would like to share any of the experience that you have in your company about social uh, corporate responsibility. Any concrete example that you can you share with us? Great questions. So, I mean, look, I could spend the next 20 minutes to explain. <laughs> there are there are lots of there are lots of great things that, that we do. I I think I'm particularly excited by that people want to give and give back to communities. And there are, in my company, there are literally thousands, tens of thousands of IBM people who are giving their time to charities, to local communities, which I think is fantastic. The one area I would highlight quickly is something called the Corporate Service Corps, <coughs> where we are taking groups of about 12 to 18 IBM people are high quality, high talent people, and we are having them work in a community around the world, mostly in our growth markets. So it may be in Malaysia, it may be in the Middle East, it may be in India, maybe in Latin America. And they're working with uh, government agencies, uh, local government, local communities to do something that is relevant to them. It may be to do with the hospital or health system, it may be to do with the water uh, filtration, it could be to do with setting something up to help some of the women's groups. And there are many examples I could point to. Um, it is transforming our company, it is transforming our young people who have the experience. They spend one month working socially, and uh, uh, on a virtual basis, they spend six weeks together in the country on the ground solving a problem, and then they will spend another six weeks back in their home countries to understand how they can take the next steps. That's transformative. Uh, it's something we introduced about four or five years ago. So far, about two and a half thousand people have gone through it. Um, and frankly, I'm desperate to join one of the groups myself but I'm too old, they tell me, so <laughs> thank you for the question. Your answer and then we finish. No, this, this, there's a second question. Second question. Okay, okay, new question there, new question and then new, terminado? new answer. No terminado, no question. ¿Cuál es la pregunta? ¿Es rápida? So how to, how, to lo how to lower it, right? Yeah, how to... Michael, please, and then we finish. I think... No pressure. No pressure. Um, <laughs> in a word, you have to make everything more social. You have to, draw, you have, you have, to have this... Um, Absolutely. Any, any change only works socially now. We, we, we know this because we, in our personal lives we see massive change happening across the world. Whether people want to have a revolution, people want to protest, they want to do anything, they, they go to social media. Um, because it, because they can have a message that they can all you know join together and achieve on, and um, and so so it doesn't matter what you use, you've got to have everybody um, empowered with a with the ability to have a voice in decisions and change um, in organisations. That way, it makes the people at the top really listen. And, that's and all I would say is be impatient. 
Don't wait for them to come to you. You go to them. Tell them what you want to do. And I think we need to go that way now. Okay. Thank you very much and welcome. <laughs>